you you intro TJ in and catch us up to speed? Like how you guys know each other? I love to, and I love to hear TJ's opinion on me, how, how we we met and everything. But TJ, like, this is so good getting to do this because he's always been a buddy of mine. That obviously we met at SMU. He's like a Dallas legend. You know, even when we got to SMU, him and Nate Etkoff and like a bunch of these kids were just like icons on campus, just super funny and knew how to have, they took having fun very seriously is the, the cringy way to say it. And uh, we we're all in the same fraternity, had a super fun time. And uh, all those guys, a lot of our friends, you know, everyone's just doing really well now and doing business and everything. But most of the same guys, I give a lot of credit to with creative tastes that, you know, they, they have so much intelligence about movies and filmmaking and everything. And, you know, they have a lot of family friends, it seems like too, that are like in Hollywood one way or another, but they, uh, they just chose to go the business route, but I thought it'd be fun to kind of see TJ's standpoint on a lot of the film stuff. Cause he's always, he's always kind of like hitting me up about like, well, what's it like on the front lines of doing show business stuff. And, and vice versa, you know, I, I respect like the business world, the corporate world and stuff a ton. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my, uh, intro. Were you, you from the get in the business world? Like was your major something business related or did you ever dabble in entertainment at all? Did I? Yeah. Oh no, no. Purely just here as a fan. Uh, not at all. I, I'm not remotely talented in that regard. Uh, <laughs> did you ever consider it? Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe in retrospect, I don't know. Like, I think I'll do. I don't know what doing that growing up means. Like, does that mean like doing theater or doing? You know, how does that usually begin? I mean, I don't know about Duke, but I started. I like I was a theater kid, and I was really into the, really? Of the camera stuff. Yeah, I did all that through. I mean, I was doing theater stuff since I was like six years old. Um, no, oh, I wow. see that. That's why this is good because it actually forces us to like get to really know each other. Like, yeah, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, um, and so I was doing the acting thing for a while, and I went to school for acting, but then I realized like directing was a thing. I really understood what directing was all about. Like I didn't know how to work a camera, but I realized that there's this position on set where it's like you can visualize everything, you can communicate your vision, but you don't have to be as technically gifted. And so, yeah, that's how I kind of fell into this path. How about you, Duke? Yeah. And by the way, I want to put on that because TJ was around when I got into acting school in England and stuff. It's funny. Jacob went to like an acting, like intense college program at Syracuse. And it's one of those schools that we talked about where he went and they were so heavy about like everything. And it honestly, like, like, uh, discouraged him from acting he was like this isn't the way to get the most creative or the most out of my creativity and stuff i want to want to you know go a different route with it but i just always find that interesting because i can and relate all, to, to touch on that too all the professors there and this is kind of common theme with like a lot of conservatory programs yeah. they're all kind of like up their own ass and they like have their own process and they're like this is how you're an actor and like especially for syracuse and i hope they're watching now like they they've been you know they haven't been involved in the industry for like 30 plus years so like I, my advice for anyone who wants to go that way and wants to do like I like how Duke went to England like they're always known as I mean we actually dig into what the reality was and it's not like these hoity-toity like what you think it would be but um I think especially like the LA programs and the stuff that's closer to LA is probably the way to go because they're actually like working industry professionals. Like we brought on like Trey Calloway is that USC professor who's like, he's killing it with like screenwriting and producing and all that kind of stuff. So. TJ, what, what do you think? Like you've listened to a couple of our episodes kindly enough and, and you've like, we've uh, kept in touch through like all my pursuits and stuff with this. What, what do you think about my lineage coming from, SMU, obviously, I came from a show business family and stuff. Well, what's your perspective on all of it? <laughs> yeah, wait, you just showed up. Uh, I'm sure we were at a bunch of things first semester, but uh, you never really announced yourself. I don't think it was until we were actually pledges that I met you. 
Um, hmm. Let me think. I don't know. I just, like, I, I don't know if it's, you know, your last name, like all, all our parents knew what it was, but you know, we're, you know, uh, <laughs> too young know for that. that, but they're like, Oh, Van Patten stuff. That's kind of um, true, dude. Like That's people awesome. who are in that, like the next generation, they're all like, Oh, you like Van Patten. But then yeah, it's like shocked if you didn't know the name type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Grandfather was a huge deal. Yeah. I won the lottery 20 times over having not only someone who was successful, but just like the best examples of like how to live a good life, obviously. Yeah. Wait, so back to like your experience in, uh, at Syracuse, is that like the norm now for like actors to to go to schools like that or do that or, or or do they like come more i don't know more randomly now because of just different mediums to kind of like audition yourself or um great question i feel like the norm is definitely now to go to a conservatory type thing like it's exploded the amount of people who now go to like the amount of colleges that now have an acting major uh -huh. i think that was a thing like 10 15 years ago um I don't necessarily think it's the best approach. I mean, I think it's the norm, but the kids who like grow up, I mean, there's a lot you can say about like kid actors and how that kind of fucks you up. But the kids who like actually have the practical experience of like being on sets and everything, it's definitely a different, different scene, like being removed from the whole thing and being in a conservatory. It's not really, you know, you can learn like theories and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like, does it really help with auditioning? Does it really help like knowing how to take direction on a set? But yeah, to answer your question, I think uh, is definitely the norm. I would, and I would take it even a step because we always talk about like, what do you learn out of those conservatories? Does it help making you a better storyteller or acting as role playing? You know, like if you're going to play any part from just making one line come to life, you know, with no character description, there's just so many examples of auditions for like the best directors, like even Quentin Tarantino. They're just describing the auditions for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He wouldn't even give them uh, descriptions of what the acting was going to be about. He would just really? like give you random abstract things, which I actually at the moment kind of find that a little lame. But what, like play purple or yeah, whatever? Yeah, bullshit like yeah, that. that bullshit. Just seeing how I think what that is is A, to like test how you are under pressure, but then also to see. When left your, to your own devices, what is your taste? You know, what is your influences? What's going to come out uh, for better or for worse? But like, do those acting programs make you better at storytelling and stuff? I think it comes down to the same thing as uh, A, acting classes in LA, acting classes in England, acting classes anywhere. It's amazing how much bullshit there is in the entire world of, you know, performance arts, there's so much unhelpful stuff. I had no idea, but you really want to find something that like is like a good sports coach that is going to bring the best out of you. And even if you don't end up going into acting or into writing or into directing or in, you still learn how to like make something fun and interesting and, you know, make it useful of your time, especially if you're paying money. So some of those academic programs are good, but you really have to do your research. And I found a lot of shitty acting classes in LA too when I came back here. I mean, I really went through the ringer. I was about They're to stop expensive. them. Expensive. They're long and exhausting. You hardly and get time like, to like put them on. What's like a typical format of a lesson like with a group? Is, is it almost like an improv? Like you take turns and you're just kind of given a, a scene or... I would say the most standard is they start at like seven o'clock and they go for like four hours. The The rate tends to be like they're way too long, in my opinion. They go to like 11 at night, which if you work the next day, you're fucked. And then usually a scene study is the main thing. So you get a scene assigned to you before. Usually 50% of them are plays. 50% of the classes are like maybe stuff that's on TV right now, like going out for it. And the teachers will have access to those scripts. And you get a scene and then you rehearse it with your partner beforehand and you come in and you perform it. And most classes, I'd say, 
probably 65 percent you get to go up every time every class you get like 10 minutes you know to go up and the teacher communicates and it's pretty straightforward like i don't see any huge qualms with that um but you get into some of the more prestigious classes that are bad in my opinion some of these teachers that kind of rest on their laurels of like having taught brad pitt and al pacino even way back and whatever you know they'll, they'll use every excuse in the book or every credential in the book and they start getting so into their own explaining and often for the longest time i found that the people that were performing on in front of everyone they were miscommunicating with the coach and the coach like didn't know how to explain things they were a bad coach they didn't know how to make things good especially in the ethereal world of acting where everything's very abstract subjective not very tangible not easy to communicate um so that's it but i finally found an acting class where it was like you got up at the beginning of the class everyone had the same material everyone had one of like three scenes so it really didn't matter who your scene partner was you were encouraged to rehearse outside of class like get together with people outside of class and then when you would come in and you had all these tools they recommended that were super simple not very precious at all it was like Try everything just thinking like, I'm going to take the lines and make everything funny. I'm just going to try to make everything funny. It might make it stupid, but at least it's going to be a choice on everything. And then try it as if I'm looking through the lens of making everything sad. And then it just puts it through that. And then you start to find out, you start to break the ice. Then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, try it like as if you're Dennis Reynolds from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You know? Or yeah. like, uh, or Cartman from South Park. Or it just became very like, creative it felt really creative and then everyone would do the scenes once and after everyone did the scenes once it was just like rapid fire you see the scene a bunch of times and by the time it got to your turn oftentimes you were like oh that person did that really well i'm gonna bring that into my own scene because i just saw someone do my scene and they they found something in it that was better than what i found fuck i'm gonna so it became an emphasis on the writing figuring out what is the writing signaling as a blueprint i'm going to put my like creative hat on and really find out how to make this better than the next person because that's now you're thinking how the producers and directors are going to be thinking in those in those rooms you're like okay there's 25 people going how can i make mine the best rather than yeah. getting caught up in the precious technique stuff now you're just in using your instincts to get scrappy and figure out how to make something stand out and make it make the, serve the story so you do all that one time sorry i'm going on for a long time here i go for it uh you do it all once then we have these coaches who it's not even a big deal who the coach is, you know, the coach would like, we'd have substitutes all the time, but they're all kind of working actors and like, just like not precious, just kind of like facilitators. And they would, they'd be like, all right, good job, everyone. And they'd give you like one minute of feedback. Like you did this good, but not this, not so good. You did this good, but not this, not so good. And then he would be like, all right, here's the material. You guys all did the same material. This is what I took away from it. Actually, the guy just avoided a bomb at the beginning of the scene. He, he just got out unscathed. I didn't see one person that realistically portrayed escaping a bomb threat. It was all a little pussyfooted around. It was all a little pussyfooted. And uh, they had to go see their mom after that. Like, you know, uh, what movie was that where they saw their mom? Um, this movie? Do you think any of you got close to that? No. So maybe go in that direction. It was like very applicable realistic and we broke yeah. down the scenes the beats and it was not personal at all it wasn't like oh you as the actor need to have this instrument and do it no it was like here's the scene here's the material this is what the writer's going for now go for it fucking go for it and if you don't get to this week that's fine but maybe next week try for it and then after that we all did a second time we all did a second time but it, it was like there were a break and we all went through it but then it was stop and go and you would start it and you would do the scene, but if something was like, could be better or needed a different color on it or just to try something, the coach would like stop you and be like, try this. Or, and we were very thought-based, like trying to get into the character's head. Like, what is the character thinking? And he would literally say like, think right before you say the line, like, oh, so great to say, see you. Think like, oh, this bitch. And so you would literally <laughs> like, you could even say it out loud. You could say like, this bitch. Oh, so great to see you. You know, and it would feed into... It was sick. I should probably get back into that class. Anyway, that's how I got good.
That sounds like a great class. Duke and I hate the like self-indulgent acting processes where you're just like, yeah, let me get in touch with my emotions. Like think back to this past moment and just stay you in that. Cry. You can yeah. cry. I bring up this scene all the time from my time in acting school. There was this one kid, this guy who like, he had this scene and the teacher was like, yo, like really get in touch with this like traumatic moment from your past or whatever. He ended up just like sobbing profusely and it was really uncomfortable to watch. And it wasn't connected at all with the scene. And it was just like watching someone go through this intense therapy session. And then he ended it and he felt like he just accomplished this like massive thing. It's like, that's not what acting is. Like you can go that way and like be self-indulgent, whatever. But at the end of the day, if it's not communicating that story, that the audience wants to see that we're expecting, then it's like, what's the point? You know? Right. Yeah. I noticed that so much in the beginning and all these really big acting classes too, that people were like, people were like, Oh wait, does this mean I'm not supposed to be an actor? Cause I don't like going through therapy. I don't like going through my own like intense experiences and like doing all that. And part of me was like, that doesn't mean you're not an actor. I didn't sign up for it. So that I could go through therapy. I'm sorry. I don't need to go through therapy. To right. Or go back through all your emotions to like channel. Yeah. Something. I don't think that's why I do it. <laughs> I it do doesn't it. Sound fun. No, it doesn't sound fucking fun. And so, so much about that. I'm so r- glad that I stuck to my guns on that because when I found through that class and through doing sketch comedy and not just because sketch comedy is about comedy, but because sketch comedy is a good barometer for performance, I think is I found out that it's fucking storytelling. And when I get to play, I had an audition yesterday to play this tough guy that chewed out his little brother that he takes care of. And I'm held ransom. And finally, I need the little brother to like take care of me. I'm not going through my own therapy with that. Yeah, sure. (laughs) I might think of something in my life that like charges me or like something from a movie that I saw that charges me up that like I can channel. But I'm really trying to role play. I ask myself questions like, what would it be like to be that? Where is that? I'm trying to get into this guy's head. That's, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's still weird. But if you're serving a story and ultimately like you're going to have this fun experience with people on set and make this movie that comes down to the filmmaking and making it good and making it cinematic and everything, that's pretty cool to me. And you're making money doing it. Pretty down for that as a job. I'm not just trying to fucking like, oh, like go through all this shit all the time. It's like, no, it's to serve a, like a fucking story. So, and by the way, I did it with Harrison. For instance, Harrison filmed it with me. It's hilarious, dude. He doesn't see that side of me ever. Like, like I'm putting myself on film doing this like fucking tough guy, like chewing this kid out. Like, uh, I mean, you know, I can even do a bit for you guys. Just like, yo, Sambo. Yo, Sambo. When I'm talking... Talk back to me, shit. You know, I'm just like going off and I end up like freaking out at him because he didn't beat these kids up and stuff. And to try to convey that in a real way is its own skill and make it seem like those lines have never been said before in my head, even though they have 300 times. That is a skill. That's different. So I started seeing a disconnect between these wanky acting classes that were super into like into the wrong stuff. And then I started hearing real actors that were auditioning all the time doing big parts for like other stuff and like comedy and and everything that were real working actors and their barometer of what they cared about seemed so different from the lame little acting class they seemed like they were more about like bringing life and making stuff good whatever it was and oftentimes that's making it funny even if it's in a drama or a horror film being comedic relief but it's making it a worthwhile story there's something about being so connected with the circumstance of the story where you being in the circumstances. Yeah. And you like enter this flow state almost where if you're so tied in it, that's when it starts to get really fucking fun. If you're really like living moment to moment and you're acting in something, it's not about like, let me think about when I was hurt as a child. Right. Like, no. yo, like I'm in this circumstance. This is a scene. This is a table. It's like, I'm interacting with this human. All that shit's really fun. That's what I loved about acting. You know? And by the way, the biggest thing, Jacob, we've talked about this before, but I've had to tell myself, I'll tell you why too, but a big tool for me lately, before I go into a scene, like make it, have this lens on where I'm looking at it through 
anyone can speak at any second. I'm, even though I know what's going to happen next, I try to fake my brain out so that I could talk next. I could, I'm on the edge of my seat, really on the edge of my seat. Cause it gets your mind thinking a different way. I watch my, my buddy Tanner, who I do Valley Mentality with. We auditioned for the same thing the other day, a Netflix show, one hour show. And, you know, I felt good about it, but like, it's no excuse, but I had a pickleball tournament the weekend, this past weekend. And I got the audition on like the Friday night and it was due Monday. And I was like, I could um, we'll see about this. And for some reason I wasn't that passionate about the part. I don't even think I got to read the script. Um, end up doing it. It was fine. Like it was good. I worked on it with a coach and he actually, he did this thing where you know, I knew the lines, but he's like, I'm still, I don't want you thinking about the lines, like trying to search them. I'm going to hold up the lines for you. And so that always, I told him before, and sometimes if I do that, if I just look at the pages and not act as the person, I go into like a vortex, you know, I get a little flat, but whatever, it was good. I sent in Tanner audition for the same thing. We, I'm like, dude, let's compare and contrast auditions, self tapes. And he sent me his, and I sent him mine. His was so good. It was the best audition I've seen in a long time. And I told him, and I was like, dude, because it wasn't perfect. His lines were kind of all over the place. He was throwing, he was paraphrasing, but he was made so much out of every moment. It was so detailed. It was so clear, the circumstances. He was referring to things off camera that were like very specific. It felt like it was just living, actually happening. He's on, he is on the edge of his seat. He actually cares what's happening in that moment. And that's, I don't think that's that tough. I just think that you have to remind yourself as a tool to do that. And and you have to know the lines well enough so that like you don't have to worry about what lines next. You just, you know, you're like really, you're really engaged. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I looked at mine. Mine was a little more like subdued, not as enthusiastic. And what for what it's worth, he could have just been being nice, but he responded. He's like, dude, yours were great. I like the subdued thing from you. Uh, what else? Was there any other compliments? Um, at the end of the day, too, you never know what the casting director or director is looking for. For sure. That's the for wild sure. card. They could want the subdued performance, you know? You just 100%. Um, but that did inspire me. And I've had an audition since. And I told him, dude, this fired me up. And this latest one, I really told myself, like, be, be willing to talk next. Be really engaged. Like, get off script. Because that makes you really in the moment, I think. And uh, that is fun. That gets really fun. Then you're like, then you're like, fuck, I don't even feel like I'm acting. I'm just uh, in these circumstances that are ridiculous. And at least from my POV, like on the other side, I don't really give a shit from like a self tape if it's line perfect. Like on set, I want it to be line perfect, but if like you're not even looking like if someone knows all the lines but they're not living any of the lines it's like you're not yeah. gonna pick that person you're gonna pick the person who's in it emotionally in the way you want 100%. you typically get like a full scene or like or like in, do you have someone to work off of typically too or like if there's more or multiple people i'd say the standard is they send you an audition self-tape with two scenes and that's it and you get the two scenes, but you get two full scenes and you get a breakdown of like the plot line and everything and what your character is. And then that's it. Sometimes when you're lucky, they'll send you a script. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. And my auditions, you know, sometimes I work with a coach if it's a bigger one and they'll film it with me. Uh, other ones that are smaller, I'll just work with my roommates or whatever. No. What's All your right. uh, pre-audition routine? I find there. that generally just by spending time, it takes probably around two hours for me to memorize most of my scenes. Um, that's like a good barometer. But by spending time just memorizing it, I learn the material really well. You're sitting with it. You're saying it over and over, trying it different ways to cement it in your head. And then just by doing that, you learn the circumstances. Um, that's really it. And then if I'm, Lucky, I mean, I was just listening to Hugh Grant on Mark Marin's podcast, the comedian, the, you know, he's kind of a cranky comedian. Um, it's called WTF. Uh, 
And Hugh Grant does, you know, he's a real actor's actor, despite his stuff that comes off really candid and funny. He he wants to understand his character as well as he can to feel like he's really has something to sink his teeth into. So he uh, he'll like he'll ask himself questions like, well, why why did the character say that uh, he wanted to see his mom? Well, who is his mom? And he goes down the rabbit hole. Who is his mom? And he makes up all this stuff, backstory for it. And then when he's acting, for the most part, he says he throws it away. He tries not to like think about that stuff, but naturally it'll make him more engaged in this fake world. Um, mm. He'll get into this own little thing. It's really childish. Like it's, you're playing pretend, you're making up things that aren't real, but the more that you commit to these fake things, the more the, this story is going to come to life. You know, you're doing it for the audience. And uh, so he does that, Hugh Grant. And I try to do that as well. I think I know that is the most important thing for my acting. The more that if I'm, if I'm committing to real concepts about the story that aren't necessarily on the page, I know my work is going to be deeper, even if it doesn't play as deeper to the audience. It, for me, that's the type of work I need to be doing. And yesterday in my audition, I found that a lot of it. I found meanings and lines that I was like, oh, that's kind of how that is. If that was happening in real life. You know, the guy says to his brother, he's like, he's like, he calls him like, oh, you're the man. I know. I know. No, you are. You're the man. And I played that. I could have just played it one way, kind of flat. But I played it like how I was the disapproving brother. And at this point, when I said, you're the man. I played it, at, I said it as if I knew that other people already knew that he was the man and I was just accepting it openly with my brother and that like I was this dick that was like, yeah, I'm going to be cold to you, but I know you're the man and uh, I just had to accept it. See, that's context. That's legitimate mm -hmm. context that I brought into it and that'll hopefully play. Is there a type? that you prefer playing because you just mentioned being a dick is that fun i mean i guess the, the probably a no-brainer it's probably fun to be an asshole uh but is is that something you probably like the most or um it definitely depends i i probably don't have a time i used to, jacob and i talk about this all the time i used to be a, when i wasn't that i didn't really know what i was doing it was tougher for me to actually play what is my casting type which is kind of just like the cool young lawyer kind of like you know, maybe like heartthrob or whatever. And that was kind of like, because I didn't know, if, I didn't know how to make it real. It felt very corny when I was mm -hmm. doing it a little bit. I didn't know how to make it interesting. Well, it's a really one-dimensional archetype. I flipped that on its head. I cast Duke in this one short I did called Red Dress. It's a horror short. It's like all I do is just horror shit. And <laughs> he plays this like really intimidating kind of um stoic uh like american psycho have you ever seen that movie with christian yeah, yeah, oh, it was yeah. Kind of based on that character and he killed it and it brought out this really like dark side of duke that i've never seen but it was always there just lurking beneath the surface you can see that where it's yeah. you know borderline creepy with the eyes uh yeah it's there uh, it's there yeah. <laughs> um well, I think of nothing else, like I've come to really be easygoing about different types. Like in college at even Bristol, they would ask, like, what type are you? What type is this person? Everyone and audience, what type do you believe? And I hated that. It always made it so bad. Not for me. I always got compliments, but for other people, I felt so bad because I think it could have been handled better. Like some people, I mean, if I wanted TJ to play a uh <laughs> Well, something that's the opposite of you, you know, like a, I don't know, goth Australian, let's say. <laughs> right. Or like, how about, how about like yeah. a gangster, how about a gangster Australian? And yeah. like, people might be like, are you, are you out of your mind? Like, I'm not going to cast TJ in that. Some people would be like that. They'd be like, I'm not going to cast TJ. I would say, no, I'm going to show TJ the movie Animal Kingdom, which is about these Australian gangsters, really good movie. Uh, and I'm going to have him practice an impression of that over and over and over and try to get into the heads of those guys what it's like to be like that and you're gonna freaking have a shot at that and i think it's as simple as that i think anyone can kind of do it they just need the right guidance mm. and so for me if i'm doing uh you know 
I'm going to have to prove to people different parts that aren't my immediate archetype when you see me, but that's, I know I can do that. And that's the beauty of it. I did a uh, movie that's about to come out actually like an independent movie about like one night in a fraternity party gone wrong. And it was kind of filmed like euphoria, like really kind of gritty mm. and it's supposed to look like one shot. And Blaine Kern is the lead, actually. He he was oh, nice enough to recommend me. Yeah. And uh and he I'm the fraternity president. And I have like these crazy scenes where I'm like, I have to kick Blaine out of the fraternity and you know, we bring him, you know, I grab him by the neck and like go into a fight and take him out. There's and we're shooting it during a party. So there's all these extras in front of all these people, and I'm like, ah, everyone, I'm like freaking out take him into the room and I tell him like, he's the reason why our buddy died. And, you know, I have to like, just go off on him. It's so heavy. And it was so easy for me to go crazy and to really be stern and impassioned, especially in front of all these people. And then we got into improvising it a little bit. And I was like throwing out new lines that were like really good every time. And, uh, yeah, sometimes that anger stuff comes easily to me. I think I've watched a lot of movies. I think I know how to like channel that. I think I probably get off a little bit to like doing that in front of people too. Like crying, doing that stuff. Like once you get going, it's like warmed up. I just like, you can feel that everyone else is ready for you to do that. So you kind of feed off that a little bit. I, I've gone the opposite way of being bad in front of people. Now I'm like, I'm healthy about it. I'm like, no, people want you to do a good job. Um, and, and I try to, my North star in acting now is bring this vision to life in the best possible way, whether you agree with it or not. So like when I see the concept and I get underneath it, then I'm like, I don't give a shit if it's the worst piece of junk ever. I don't care if nine-year-olds made it. I'm going to still serve the story the best possible. And so I just fucking go in, dude. You know, I try to just make it really good. And, and I, I think I do have something to show acting wise when it comes to like my, my taste on mm -hmm. a part. And a lot of the time too, you don't really have that stuff in you unless you're given the opportunity. Like yeah. I worked with this actress this last weekend and she, it was her first horror thing she ever did. And the role was like a woman, like a mother who drowned her kid. And it's when like the dad like discovers this shit when he comes home. And it was all shot as a POV. And I've done like a hundred plus shorts. And this was the first time I was genuinely terrified on set because she was so commanding of that role and so oh. horrifying, like her facial expressions, everything, she was so committed and in it. And unless I'd given her that opportunity, she might've never figured that out for herself that she's like really good at this one thing. And drowning children. Yeah. <laughs> that that is kind of head i doing horror films is kind of nuts if you do jacob and i have done a few like that yeah. he was nice they're the most fun to shoot i mean obviously i'm biased because it's all i do but i i feel i feel that way everyone i work with is like this is this is some of the most fun we've had just because it's not like you know you think it'd be scarier or whatever this last one was but for the most part it's just like super creative and just trying to figure stuff out it's cool. Go yeah, on. it is. It is a very specific task, how to make something the most frightening that it can be. And so that's kind of like a fun. High bigger than life thing like that. Yeah, Either that way. is going to be story worthy. If something's actually genuinely scary, you know, that's going to be a, mm -hmm. a watch worthy scene. So that's kind of fun. We're, we're going to be kicked off in 20 seconds. Do we want to go over? Yeah, let's go 10 minutes more. Yeah. You yeah. Pop back on yeah, definitely. Like, Let's do it. All right. I, I was going to ask how many or what goes into producing a short? Like how much time? Like, like just walk me I'll through. Tell it. you in two seconds. Duke's hiding back there, but the camera's following. But to to pick up where we left off, you were asking yeah. shorts and like deadline for shorts and what what goes into it. Mm -hmm. Um, essentially, bro. Like, I kind of divided it up into two. Like. I do both the traditionally shot and cut shorts, which is where you need to like get a DP. You've got your actors, makeup, costume, all that stuff. The biggest nightmare for me is coordinating everyone's schedules. But I mean, I had, I've done so many of these that something of that scale, it's like I wrote a script 
on Monday and now we're shooting it on Sunday. It's like really stressful. It's a lot of moving parts and stuff. But for the most part, if you have a team and a crew you've been working with for a while, it's like you can put something together pretty fast. But then it's like the bulk of what I do, because I try and release stuff weekly, is just like a couple actors. I'm shooting it, whether it's like a POV camcordery style or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like horror, you have more flex. It doesn't all have to be like studio quality. It's like sometimes something can be scary if it's more found footagey and stuff. So do you go to locations or do you kind of improvise or like can you kind of go anywhere in LA or? Yeah, I mean, I've got a few spots I love. There's Griffith Park, which is massive. They have a lot of like creepy shit, underground tunnels and stuff. I've used that place a bunch. But um, for the most part, I actually ask, the actors to use their location like that's part of the thing that's the reason mm-hmm. i've been able to put so many on it on their feet so um yeah yeah mostly either like outside gorilla style we do uh there's this one uh like valley college like community college that has a massive campus that i go on and we do stuff there but yeah for the most part it's it's homes mm. If you shoot horror too, do you need like special effects or any, does any of that kind of creep in? I haven't seen any of, I need to look at your stuff after this. I mean, at least Duke's stuff, the stuff we've done together. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you um, can tell by how close of a friend someone is with me by how little they've seen of my stuff. The, the less, that means the closer they are. If they've seen a lot of my stuff, that means they're not close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of the same, honestly. Like at this point, my girlfriend is like, you like you made a short like what like it's been like totally. shorts deep that she hasn't watched but um yeah i uh you definitely have to watch the ones with duke they were a good time and i was gonna you ask you something about that. horror specifically hmm? you you had a question about like horror specifically or not oh yeah yeah oh yeah like the special effects thing right yeah yeah so for the most part i do like practical stuff Only because to get really solid special effects, you need someone who like really knows what they're doing. Um, But I can have like more effective looks and and stuff. Like like I use like high-end masks, like Halloween masks are usually made out of latex. And so I'll use like silicone masks and it makes it, it like moves with the person and stuff. So you can do a lot of creepy shit in camera. (laughs) Are you a horror guy at all or not really? I... I feel like there's a like a real clear definition. I, I, I more of like a thriller type, but cool. I don't know. What what would you call your favorite horror movie right now? Man, right now, um, I mean, dude, I love all like the Conjuring franchise. Mm, okay, awesome I was about to there. say, yeah. yeah, it's kind of my mo. Anything yeah. that James Wan has done is my shit. Aquaman, <laughs> yeah, top of the list. <laughs> Big Aqua guy. Yeah, it's kind of wild how he took that turn. He's doing all his like Marvel shit, but you know, maybe you'll do the new Green Lantern. Never, bro. That's never happening. <laughs> Red Lantern. Yeah, if it's horror, yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you have a genre that you think suits you best? I my favorite genre tends to be like you could call it dramedy, but kind of yeah. like. You know, heavy slice of life stuff that's like seemingly dark about, you know, tragedy maybe, but that finds humor in it. Hmm. Um, you know, Did like, you like I one? love, I love like Birdman. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, the movie Sideways, Paul Giamatti, Tom Hayden mm-hmm. Church, they're going on like bachelor party weekend and shit goes away, but, but they're really funny. You know, everyone's always trying to find light through stuff. Yeah. White Lotus is pretty fun. I don't think it's perfect, but I like that tone. Yeah. Who in uh who in White Lotus do you think you'd be, or if you wanted to play a role there? Kind of obvious. Cameron. Which one is Cameron? Or uh, he's the British guy, Theo. That'd be sick, of course. But uh, oh no, Theo James. Yeah. Yeah. Theo James went to Bristol Vic Theater School. We have no good actors anymore. I feel like there's like an underrated amount of British people now on our stuff. It's everywhere. Yeah, really. Brits have like every American role. Yeah. Right? 
I was thinking, like, I who's, think... who's the American that would have gotten that role? But I just, I don't know. Oh, you said, do we have any good actors? In yeah, it? yeah, that's what I was saying. It seems like there's way more. Yeah, I mean, that from the US. I know. I think a big part why those Australian, Irish, Scottish actors, whatever, is because they're already accomplished over there, but no one knows who they are over here, so they can get cast as still being unrecognizable, but they have all um, this kind of experience and success under their belt a bit. You could get funding um, that way from like international stuff. Mm. Like uh, a lot of people are shocked that that actors are Brits. Like even for me, like Will Poulter, I just realized that that guy's a Brit. I had no idea. You hear an interview and you're like, holy shit. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or like the first time I heard like Sarah Snook talk, I was like, oh my God, like you're Australian. What a reference. I Sarah Snook. I saw her before she was in succession in a play in London. And uh, it was average. <laughs> uh, I guess probably nothing against her. I have a friend that just ran into Alexander Skarsgård the other day. Sick. Mikus from Zoolander. Mikus. I had to double check that. I can't believe I didn't know that on the fly. Duke Lemon. They're like it, in our group text, they're all ta- they're all talking about like debating actors, and I was just like, well, uh, you know, I think Skarsgård's performance in Zoolander really puts him ahead above all the rest, and everyone's like. What do you mean Zoolander? He was not in Zoolander. I'm like, are you forgetting Mikus? The back. orange yeah. mocha frappuccino fight? <laughs> I know it was a joke, Mikus. I just didn't get it. Just didn't get it right away. I, like, but you did answer it. Like, <laughs> you didn't get yeah. it. <laughs> uh, he looks uh, so young there. It's crazy. But I guess that's what, over 20 years old now. So I think he always looked pretty young. He just kind of he's aged well, but yeah. yeah. Um those are the things. I mean, you get those little comedic roles where you get to stand out, and then you know maybe you got teed up into something else. Um, uh, TJ, real quick, bro, let's let's talk about you for a second here. What's uh, what's the work life as you've been lately? What what are your goals, dreams, aspirations? I don't know. I uh, I'm just trying to make it work. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Now, what do you what do you do with for... business? Uh, I just fin- actually finished a term position at the AFL CIO. It was like a political campaign job that I took to move here. Um, and then right now I'm just doing kind of freelance stuff, trying to find uh, something more permanent here. But I I love it. It's crazy. I sold my car. Like I my entire family's from Dallas. Like literally, siblings, parents, grandparents, all of us went to SMU. Yeah. All of us stayed there. It's like, it's almost a joke. Um, so uh, went to undergrad and law school there. So like just never, ever branched out. And then now I've been here for a year. So how was law school? It sucked. <laughs> no, it's fun. It's, it's like a trauma that I don't know. The further away you get from it, the, I think it, it ages favorable. The more you appreciate it. Was it, yeah, was more. it kind of that? famous like out of that movie the paper chase or something where it's competitive yeah. and you're competing against other people the first year yeah yeah because a, a lot of jobs only hire you if you're like a certain threshold so like it is very competitive like if you're like top 10 or top 15 or top 25 like certain major firms just have like their ratings firm. yeah so yeah so people that's why like i don't like have you seen legally blonde that scene where yeah. l like gets kicked out of the study group but like study groups really important sharing outlines like people Holy get really shit. pissed if you kind of give away your stuff um how many and, people are in the program in the first place um i think like 240 and there was like and you like had you, you basically have your own unit your first year and you go, you go to this, all your classes with the same group um and then second and third year, you have a lot of discretion to kind of take whatever class. Do you have a day job as it's going on? No. No. So people could do it. Um, like one of my buddies, like uh, I can't imagine too, so like having a kid or having a baby and doing law school, but some people do that, but it, it's, that's just torture. How long was law school? Three years. Wow. It should be two. It, it's, it's. It's a total racket. Um, so you're so you're doing it. Uh, you how many credits does it end up having to be compared to college? Um, is it a credits thing or? 
it is a credits thing. I forget. I, I graduated a couple years ago. Um, All right. So you, you got to do that. It ends up taking two or three years, whatever. And then it was tough for you also. You didn't go into law, right? So I did briefly. And then, yeah, then I got a random job during the pandemic that was different and then just stuck with that. <laughs> but like you could still find a hook into cases and stuff like i've talked to some people that go into the law world and they're like it sucks like being on commission like or uh you know being paid around the clock like hour to hour you're just always working and you don't get paid that much money when you start out yeah i've been like i remember one time it helped make my decision to move on easier but like this guy i worked under um became partner and then you know you kind of had this idea that like you know you you do all this stuff and then once you get partnered you know then you made it and then you can delegate right and stuff. And, yeah. but no he was just like i did you hand off a bunch of responsibilities and then now i have to do x y and z more but like that's <laughs> not that i had no idea that was part of being a partner um and i was like oh okay so there's not really even like that an end yeah that fictitious like goal line to get past mm-hmm. um yeah but yeah what did you uh, appreciate more like being on the um, defendant side or the prosecutor? Um, or like what type of law really interests you? What you um, yeah, I worked for a litigator, but it was like um, a lot I of played the fifth contract disputes. Yeah, it seems like not stuff like that. See, that, that stuff's more interesting. Those classes were always more fun, like criminal procedure. Right? Okay. Um, all the cases that like from like born out rights that we have now, like fourth amendment, fifth amendment. Um, and that's kind of like performative, right? Like you're yeah. on the stage, you're like, yeah. kind of, you're like making your case. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Oh, it's totally performative. Um, yeah. Being well liked is just as important as being good. Um, which is, which is not right to me. I, the more I see, the more I see on like Dateline and stuff, like these court cases in women, for instance, or anyone, but have to defend like in a rape trial or something like why they were out there and they're like well your honor i mean i was out just um you know i was trying to find my lover and uh you know i was in the wrong part of town and it's just like dude why make someone you know how many people are bad at public speaking like they're not yeah. always going to say the right thing that yeah. they're meaning and right. stuff and no exactly people are wrongfully like completely held against you uh, yeah it's not yeah it should be perfected better to me. Look into that and then keep going. And it's like a whole, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> True. And just like the nerves of just like being questioned or like, or just being like in a courtroom, like you're just not going to be your self. Do, does the jury and does the whole make, I love how we're going into law now, but this is dope. Yes. Uh, do they take that into account? How the nature of the system is a bit, ridiculous yeah and like i think you're like you're like well aware and people bring up like you know you got to stick like truly to the facts um or like juries are reminded to like oh yeah um, like to purely go off of you know what was said in the re- like on the record um but what do you think of the trump what do you think of the trump case now oh that'll be fun <laughs> <laughs> I honestly have not kept up. I've just, I just tuned that out. No. How about the Amber Heard trial? That was, uh, that was amazing. A bit more. About the Gwyneth Paltrow trial. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That was, that was a little dirty for her. She sued for one dollar. She countersued and she won. Um. Yeah, it was heavy. There's a ton of TikToks and memes during that because, like, she was there in person, so it was just like her doing like resting bitch face the entire time. <laughs> uh, that tracks. That tracks with her. Yeah. Um, uh, nice. Or do we, I don't know anything about her. Yeah. No, I I saw her on Shark Tank actually as a guest shark. There's a guest and shark. Yeah, I, I huh. give her a lot of credit. That's like heart do it. Well, she always just seems like so cool for school and like yeah. oh, i'm gonna do business i'm gonna do my like it my way and for her to do shark tank and go out with these people that are like you know let the money talk and you know helps with like small little businesses that are like kind of joe schmo and she got out there and she's funny 
and like yeah. took the piss out of everyone and kind of like overcompensated for like trying to not come off as the cool Hollywood girl. Went up huge in my book. I was like, right. down. yeah. I had a friend go on, or a friend from high school that was on Shark Tank. Bryce Reed? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> what would Bryce go on Shark Tank for? He would. He would. He's got to invent something first. <laughs> uh, he's got some ideas, I'm sure. What was your uh, thing? What? Uh, with? Did they get money for the thing, or what, what did they go on with? They get money for your buddy who went on Shark Tank. Oh yeah, so it was. I don't know. Buddy's a loose term. Friendly. He he invented these hangers. You know, like kids like rip off a shirt, and sometimes they could like stretch the collar. It was basically hangers that snap like this, um, and like easily clamp down. And it was like a very simple idea. And he like he was, he was very smart when he went on because so many people go in there and have just absurd valuations that yeah, like, right. the sharks just shit on it. Yeah. So like he was asking for like seventy five thousand for like thirty percent. It was like a really, yeah. really small. And had he already had a lot of sales? I don't remember what it was years ago, but so he got a deal, but it was, he didn't have a patent yet. So it was patent pending and he got two sharks, got Barbara and Mark Cuban. Um, okay. Yeah. So you got the local, the Dallas guy. Um, yeah. Cause he was a Dallas guy, Brian. Yeah. And uh, it, it was contingent on getting a patent. And then I've yet to hear a single oh. thing about the business after. And so they, they got a deal, but it was, I don't know if he, if the patent never went through or, mm -hmm. um, so I've I've not heard a peep since then. But. Do you know Mark Cuban at all, or like do you know? No, he, people that know? He, he keeps like a really, for as like vocal and like yeah accessible he is in some ways. He's also like incredibly elusive Private. in Dallas circles. Yeah, like he does not. He he like really keeps to himself. I suppose I can kind of see that. I because like Jerry Jones, you hear about a lot more as like getting around, right? Yeah, or like the Perot family, or other like just Dallas big time yeah. like, or like really involved in you know ex philanthropy or like totally. circles here or seen at dallas country club or like do right like cuban like none of cuban that does his own bit he's got a lot of businesses and stuff but that's probably yeah, all he's always traveling a bunch he's uh yeah, that's interesting. making the maths fans <laughs> what go crazy fucking up luca yeah How, how's your sports world lately the stars kind of red wings but oh they, yeah stars star yeah. were good they lost in the yeah the the people, so I'm, I'm i'm everything else is just gravy <laughs> you son of a gun he's a uh big kansas city chiefs uh yeah. enthusiast i love uh yeah I, I didn't realize it was real but now i just like bring it up if if gamble says a word but patrick mahomes has more playoff three more playoff wins than the entire Carolina franchise. Yeah, that's not saying anything. Individual. That's crazy. In five seasons, he's already has three more. I got to give him credit. I always found him a little like annoying for some reason. He's obviously so Perfect. good. He's literally flawless. He's he by all. I knew people that knew him at Tech, and he's like, they're like, he's the nicest guy, like the most humble guy. That was always how's, the case. How was the How's the coach at Tech that became the Cardinals coach and now he just got fired? Fired? Or did he? Yeah, he got. Yeah, yeah. He, the he Mike, left. Uh, Young guy. He just left after the Cardinals had a horrible season. Oh, 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 oh. And he was the uh, um, he was the coordinator. Yeah, he was he was he was offensive coordinator when Mahomes was there. Oh, or like he was he wasn't the head coach. I don't think he was the head. Or no, he it, might have been the head coach. Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff Kingsbury, and he yeah. got all this heat because he was the coach of uh, Texas Tech when Mahomes was there. And yeah. the Cardinals were so rough. And I watched the hard knocks on them this year, too. I mean, it was pretty obvious they were going to suck. I didn't uh, – the Cardinals? Okay. First of all, you obviously didn't watch hard knocks. But two, dude, to start with, obviously he's not that good, but J.J. Watt, um, they're uh, – DeAndre Hopkins. He was suspended for six games, but now he's not on the team. They just released him. I know. I hope he goes. There's a lot of uh, Hopkins to KC rumors, which would be nice. And why, why do I always. Oh my gosh. I don't think it'll happen. Yeah. Uh, get paid somewhere. 
I don't know what it came down to a bit. It just all fell off for them, but their quarterback, uh, Kyler Murray. Yeah, Kyler Murray. Yeah. Kyler Murray he gets a lot like, of shit. Yeah. Well, dude, he gets paid so much exactly, money. Exactly, yeah. And he just didn't. Mahomes well, now is like the seventh highest paid quarterback. And that contract is just going to age now as every quarterback is going to get like the new record. Lord, Lord. Really good. He's going to be like the 15th highest paid quarterback in like five years. What do you think about the Broncos with Sean Payton going as a coach? Do you think that's going to help uh, a lot? It makes me kind of nervous. Um, it's just they're throwing around money and like not necessarily. Yeah. I don't know why you'd want to go there. Opportunity is going to be near. And yeah, it, but you could have gone to – I would have, like, taken the Chargers or – like or no, I guess they didn't fire the coach. I would have waited for, like, a team with, like, a like a young star quarterback, not 35-year-old Russell Wilson. Risky, Wolfman. though. Risky. Russ, Russ, Russell Wilson's in a – The most cringeworthy human being. He should being. be sick. I, he run, reminds me of Mahomes. What? Mahomes. That's outrageous. As far as demeanor, Mahomes seems a little humbler, though. Many. Way humbler. Russell that's Wilson, type, you should look at with, uh, He does things that are, like, physically make me cringe. Tyreek Hill is pretty brutal this year. Yeah. Um, that asshole. That asshole. Yeah, I think so. Got the last hey, one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's sports center for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we got our sports. We got our law. What other areas? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's over? right. <laughs> I agree, man. We got some more. Um, how's DC? And Dude, have you awesome. always wanted to live in DC, or is that like I, a- I've always uh, sort of? It's always been kind of a fascination. Um, his, his love for Hillary Clinton led him. Yeah, to go. she brought me there. Beautiful. She doesn't Girl, live here. I, I moved all this. <laughs> She's in New York, I think. Uh, no, I I don't see as many people as you think randomly, um, like lawmakers or stuff. Uh, someone I know saw Tucker Carlson not that long ago, out and about. Um, Georgetown's supposed to be very beautiful, right? Georgetown's awesome, yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of areas that are fun. Um it's like super easy to get around. Like it's not like New York, uh, like the metro system makes a lot of sense and it's like very cleanly laid out and um, it's dope. I love it. I didn't like the subway in New York. No, no, not for everyone. No, it's not for everyone. Um, <laughs> me. Uh, um, whenever I've gone to DC, it's been like really clean. Like, it's like the opposite. My sister just moved to New York, and she mm-hmm. loved it, but I, I could never do that. But D.C., I could see, you know? It's like... Yeah. Wow. You get more... It's like New York light in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. A little more space, a little less... You haven't seen Chris, you haven't seen Chris Kearns? I have not seen him. Uh, we hung out with him, like, a couple months ago. Leland. I need to see him. Yeah. You have to, bro. We uh, we all went I to dinner. I Connor Stewart moved here, but I need to double check that. Yeah. Wow. And then Maggie. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, dude. And you, you know had like I'm miss, I missed that. I'm, I'm gonna text him and double check. Yeah, she was always super goofy. Yeah, and, and Casey, I see from time to time. I I I'm friends with her on Be Real, so she updates me every oh. day <laughs> <laughs> from the law we, office. Are we with all the law bros? It looks like. Yes. <laughs> She's one of those that uh, stories everything. Oh, um, big story. She's doing it less lately, yeah. though. Yeah, yeah. But Jacob, yeah, she's one of those that uh, on certain nights, you will know what she's done the entire time. <laughs> like, probably, Se- like, second second. Probably, like, probably like 30, 40 minutes of like stories. To the point where like, you know, when you tap and you see on the screen, like, <laughs> yeah. like, to the point where they're like, they're dots. Like, that's wow. how many stories. That's and she'll just like, yeah. Um. Yeah, did she live like far away from you though, or like what? She just moved. She used to be closer. Um, and then I saw her a couple weeks ago at the White House when the Chiefs came. And then um, that's an absurd sentence. Yeah, yeah. All the winners come. Still crazy. Yeah, that's dope. 
Uh, any other people from SMU there? No. Do you party a lot out there? Or are you really just kind of like head down? No, it's it's much more mellow. Um, are you happy to get out of Dallas? Like, what's the? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'll be back, but like, okay. whenever I do, you know, it's probably then for good. Um, so interesting living in a different place with that mentality. I mean, I guess that was always my mentality when I was in Dallas and in England and in New York. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I never, guess I, yeah. Um, it's dope. How's uh, Skyman, Catherine? I think they're good. Um, yeah, I uh, I was texting Skyman about the Nugs yesterday. I'll see if oh, he can go to, the, go to the parade. Um, and then they're reopening Casa Bonita. Do, do you watch South Park? Jacob? Uh, some, somewhat. All right, like the, the best, ep- I think my favorite episode of all time is one of the OGs, Casa Bonita sure. one, right? It's like this shitty Disneyland in Denver it's, that like yeah, yeah. Hartman like is obsessed with, and he gets this like family to take him. He concocts his plan. Like, he's not invited. Fake the death of his friend in order to like go. <laughs> he goes to like the craziest length just to go, and then it all like falls apart when he's there. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's a real place. But they just reopened it. I think. Oh no shit! Yeah, like the South Park guys sponsored it, like paid for. Yeah, it. no, right, right, yeah, exactly. I think Trey Stone, which that is I amazing. Love I love yeah. that. Yeah. I gotta watch but, the episode. Is it as bad as it was in the show? For real, it's it was. The show sure. makes it out to seem like it's like like a super cool, like from the kids' perspective, like it's like yeah. this incredible spot that's like so awesome. It does it in like a sketch comedy way. It's like it, you no, know, it's like it clearly is a like shitty poor man's theme park. Like all the stores outside it are like pawn shops and stuff. And yeah. It's, oh, like, it's depressing. It's, 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 it's a really shitty area. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh you pat you sent a picture to all of us one time and you like drove past it this guy and i w- went in it but yeah like like the cave is tight like it's all like so small um but yeah the show makes it seem like you're like actually in like, like this- oh cliff divers yeah. oh back in <laughs> back cave. Cave. Back cave. more soap oh, beans. more soap of beans, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we like south park we like south park Hilarious. um Dude, but know. apparently that's taken like a long time to reopen. Like I saw the headlines that like two years ago, three years ago. Uh, Casa Bonita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, um, it's it's a very <laughs> like you said, surrounded by pawn shops and like stores that don't have like letters on the outside. <laughs> Dude, uh, we've been hanging out with Leland a bunch out here. As, yeah, as you'd assume. Yeah, man. That Guys, was uh. Crushing, crushing yeah. the game. That when, was uh, when we first met. Speaking of, the, when we're, we were driving to the ranch, you just like you just like a shot in the dark. Did y'all know Leland Garalnik? Which I don't know why you would ask that, but I was in. Remember, I was in your car, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah." I probably like figured. First thing I, we no, it. I probably, I probably knew Leland. Probably had said like, "Oh, dude, look out for TJ and stuff." Yeah, no, I just remember you saying that. That was like the first thing that first little mutual connection we had it was like oh, that's awesome yeah this alley bro we didn't hang out with all <laughs> all year in our pledge class uh jacob i was the one kid in our fraternity in our pledge class i was from la or we had another one but he he for some reason was already like in deep with the southerners and our fraternity was more southern in general mm-hmm. and uh very yeah yeah and I was kind of inspired because, like, my best bud, like, my next-door neighbor growing up, John Paul Harold, he came to SMU, had the best time ever. And him, in his class, who's, like, three years older than us, randomly had, like, five kids from L.A. go into our fraternity. And, like, they they kind of set the tone. And it was a great mix of different influences. And I saw that. And I was like, I want to do the same thing. That's, that seems awesome. And like, you know, the kids in the more California fraternity, the other one, I'll be friends with them anyway. And it did end up working out like that. But at first it was like working in, it was so tough to get like the Southern kids, dude. I, I'm not even like that surferish as far as like actual, if you compare me to some other people and everyone, dude, it was just, they were stubborn as shit. Oh Yeah. 
Even Harrison. Harrison still is. Yeah, a lot of uh, was it majority? I don't know. I, I guess like plurality Georgia people slash. Yeah, it's mainly southern people. Uh, In southern, we. I mean, you know, we have our like northeast as well, yeah. but like it was all sort of the same vibe. Yeah. Cocky rich kids that are stuffy, <laughs> and I was not like that. Was... Uh, I didn't know that that's where you met Harrison. Really? Yeah. Yep. Wow. First memory I have of him was we we're at like a pledge party, and I probably didn't really know that many people. And I mean, I was talking to like one of the only girls I knew probably at the time or something. And Harrison just like pops up and he's like, sees that I'm talking to a girl, just Duke, Duke, what's up, man? He's like, so sorry. He's like, where, where are the ladies at? Where are the, all the ladies at? And I'm just like, uh, and I did one thing and I got thrown out of the bar immediately. As soon as he gave that was my first recollection of Harrison. And then the second time was because we had to drive each other's cars and pledge ship, and he pulled up in my car and I had to get in. And he's driving and he just like he's way too comfortable in my car, like had the fucking sunroof down windows down i and i never did any of that i was just like dude who, like who do you think you are here like, like right. stay in your lane bro um first memory of tj i do remember the first time i saw you and nate at cough oh, it was God, like before yeah. it was bef- it was before we all uh officially joined fraternity like you guys we were all at like what connor finley or something one of their rooms or something we're just cracking up probably smoking oh, at the house yeah we're at the fraternity house smoking some herb and then uh and then yeah we drove to the ranch together it was awesome like alex over you had a really shitty car <laughs> you were the hero that was just like nice enough with we we yeah, friends with everyone but you know like, nice. in our yeah yeah we we had it's kind of sad in retrospect. Like, I hope he turned out, you know, to have a good time at another school. But he transferred. He wasn't having a good time. And, uh, but he was in our car. And, um, and who knows who the fourth is? Pettingfield. Might have been Turney. I think it was Turney. But Bettingfield, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. And someone was driving my car, naturally. I just got bullied out of being able to take my we were the we were the dinner for schmucks table. You you were the, <laughs> the the kind the kind person that got stuck with us. Uh, and uh, oh, meeting like Graham Hill on that, he was just like so funny, dude. I just remember him around the fire. Yeah, Jacob. They, asked, part, just, like, they, they put us all on this ranch, and it's like everyone got pneumonia after. Like it, but like so many things could and should have gone wrong mixing all this shit together and then like the next year they asked like if they would do it at our ranch and it's like fuck no like it, it's a, a miracle like no one like died. died uh and like there's just no way in hell like uh that was crazy but- that that was like the first thing that i'd done that i was like okay this is like the mafia yeah just outrageous it was outrageous and uh it was great but it was great. We were all camping, 35 of us who didn't know each other and January. being led by these older guys who like seemed like they were so old at the time. Now we're like, you know, equals obviously. Like, like 28. Different. Where, what? How, how long was this? This was just like two day, two nights, the, the weekend. Didn't It was five hours west. <laughs> what was it, three or five hours? Yeah, it was, it was a while. It was a while. And I was driving. These guys were going like 90 miles an hour on the freeway. Someone got pulled over. Yeah, someone and got pulled over. They didn't tell us where to go. We had to follow. We had a caravan. Eventually, they told us, like, halfway through. Yeah. I, I, again, just to, like, wean that, just just being so ridiculous in retrospect. A lot of it was a big mind fuck. Like, you weren't sure what what they yeah. had planned or what they were just trying to keep us in the dark about. Is very, like, very, felt like military-esque. I would call yeah. my parents all the time and just be like, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? And they're like, oh, just <laughs> get through it. Just get through it. Yeah, That's and they're funny. like, don't sleep in the cars. I remember that. <laughs> I think people still did. Uh, I, dude, I was so cold that night at the ranch. It was like, so cold. 
freezing. And so I stayed up all night, like sitting next to the fire. And then there's like a couple stragglers that would wake up. Graham Hill, one of them, who's still my really good friend. And uh, he he just had this like jersey on, like a Georgia jersey on. Yeah. And I remember him being like, he's full Graham mode. Like, hey, Duke, this fire is pretty warm, isn't it? <laughs> The cold oh, reached it. Crazy. Full grandma. He so he was uh the like chair or whatever of our plush class or like the organizer. And he I did not I got so much shit for this in the end, but it worked out great. But he mistakenly put my phone number wrong and like, on it. So anyway, like I just like never got called by actives. Uh it was wonderful. But then someone at the end, it, it, it got exposed. But I, I remember catching that and then just not telling him. I was like, all right. Better off. Yeah. How's yeah. Ellert doing? Are you, do you talk to Ellert a bunch? I haven't talked to him in a while. I think good. Yeah. Yeah. Are they live in Florida or? He, uh, he, ref- he was in one of our fantasy leagues. Uh, yeah. He was last and then like wouldn't do the thing. And oh, the yeah. last I heard of him, it was like, all right, Ellie, if you're not going to do this, like, we're kicking you out. And then he just left the group text. <laughs> we like, we're friends with some stubborn pricks, man. Yeah. Brunson still hasn't done his punishment. Like, that's just, that's the type of stuff that kills group. You shouldn't, be in the, you shouldn't be loud back in if you don't do it. I'm about to do my fantasy punishment. I, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> what? How much was courtside? I feel like these tickets were so cheap and you're, you had good seats. I figured you should have just gone all the way. That is a good point. It said up to $60. If someone else pays for it, I'm down. Crowd yeah. service. Oh, I'm working on a uh, tortured artist um, fund here at the moment, so I'm not going to pay more than 12 bucks. Our fantasy <laughs> punishment, Jacob because uh, I lost in fantasy football, is uh, going to a WNBA game um, and face painting. Okay. I was about to say, the game alone is <laughs> not <laughs> much of a part of it. not. No, like, I'm probably going to wear like a Brittany Griner jersey, too. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Get some pictures. Oh, they'll, oh, they'll do pictures. All right, boys. Tea yeah, table, you get to it, I guess, right? Dude, great to see you. You as well, brother. Let me crash. Yeah, of course. Anytime. Yeah. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Oh, dude, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'll I'll watch your shorts. Or do I just find them on YouTube or yeah? I'll shoot, you, I'll shoot you the link of the one that we did. We actually done a couple together. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I love that. Please do. Jacob, yeah. that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Big All right. I'll be looking for it. All right, man. It's great meeting you. See you soon. Bye. Later, boys.